180 years, nearly two centuries. Four key stories woven in, moving the spotlight over people deeply involved in our young nation's struggles over the institution of slavery. The founding and establishment of two major churches. Fun details from Fort Wayne's retail history. A note from our early musical history. Some Wayne Township and U.S. Post Office milestones. Changing times in a changing neighborhood as Fort Wayne grew dramatically and the heritage left for all of us by people and the community who pay attention to and protect their stories and the places where they happened. All that happened in and to this little house with its big history. Even though tens of thousands of us drive by fast every day and barely notice it, let's give the Alexander T. Rankin house its due right now. In 2003 and 2004, when Arch was beginning its restoration of the building, two different architectural and engineering firms studied the building and made recommendations for its care. One of the reports includes this important contextual explanation of what we now see as a modest little re residential building. I quote, in the cultural context of when, it's, of when it was built, however, the Rankin House was a gracious and well-equipped residence complete with finished plaster interior surfaces over a hand-hewn wood lathe, a relatively wide interior stairwell, an interior masonry chimney flue, and a large, still intact stormwater cistern adjacent to the stairs in the cellar. Additional evidence that the Rankin home was not a typical house is the very deliberate and careful detailing in the exterior clay masonry. I'm sitting now in the Rankin House's current front room, which is likely the room where in 1859 Elizabeth Mayer welcomed her friend Mrs. Henry Rudisill and the other women of the then young Trinity English Evangelical Lutheran Church to her home to gather before her lovely slate fireplace and discuss forming the church's first women's society. They decided to call it the Might Society, and she was elected its first vice president, with Mrs. Rudisill its first president. Both women, with their husbands, had signed the charter document founding the church in 1846. When they formed the Might Society, their church was meeting next door on Berry Street in a building built in 1837 as Fort Wayne Presbyterian, which by then had moved elsewhere. And that brings us to the Reverend Rankin, because Fort Wayne Presbyterian brought him here to be its pastor in 1837, and he helped them build that church. He went on four years later to build this house or at least most of this house. It's a complicated story with a mystery we cannot resolve. Either way though, it's a great tale. It's the story of our little house with a big history. To begin, we go back to 1837 when the Presbyterian Church assigned Alexander T. Rankin to be pastor of Fort Wayne Presbyterian Church. He was its third pastor and had been licensed as a Presbyterian minister since 1829. On February 13, 1837, he had preached about abolition in Dayton, Ohio, and had been severely beaten. He told about it in a letter that was published in two different newspapers, including The Philanthropist and The Friend of Man. Here's Alexander's description. Mr. Editors, I have convinced my labors lecturing again. The inju injury I received in the mob scrape on the 13th kept me pretty close confined until the 21st, but the effects are now nearly removed. The opposers of abolition are supremely deluded in their measures to arrest the progress of anti-slavery principles. One would think that the blindness of fanaticism itself would be more judicious in the selection of the means. Never was more strikingly verified the old maxim, whom God intends to destroy, he first makes mad, than in the late disgraceful riot in Dayton. The influence of that affair unquestionably has made more abolitionists in that place than I could have done in a dozen lectures. How true it is that God sometimes makes even the wrath of man to further his inscrutable purposes. Everything has been done to prejudice the community against me and the cause of human liberty, but the spirit of inquiry cannot be intimidated. The people will think and determine for themselves. If the father of lies had been there himself in person, his fruitful genius could not have exceeded the invention of his dutiful subjects in fabricating and retailing slander. As a specimen of the false statements, take the following. One man is said to be willing to swear that I said publicly that I was not only in favor of amalgamation, but intended to marry a black wife. The most unlikely thing in the world for a man to say who has a wife and children at home. 
But whether the opposers throw eggs, beat me, lie, or be still, inquiry goes on, our cause advances. The result reminds me of the mark of a remark once made by an opponent. He said abolition was the most singular thing he had known. For whether the lectures were opposed by arguments, or their meetings broken up by mobs, or were attended in peace, the cause advanced. Rankin's recuperation meant he did not arrive here until fall. The congregation did not yet have a permanent home, but it quickly rallied around him, and a framed church was built on East Berry Street between Barr and Lafayette that year, where United Way of Allen County has its offices in the historic Weatherhog, McCulloch Weatherhog Double House now. This house did not exist then. Rankin bought property for his residence at the corner of Hannah and Lewis Streets then. Rankin came from a family of abolitionists deeply involved in the Underground Railroad, and he maintained that activity here. In 1838, he helped organize the Indiana Anti-Slavery Society and was elected a director. In 1839, he was hired by the American Anti-Slavery Society to increase support for abolition by organizing activities in Indiana and selling subscriptions to William Lloyd Garrison's newspaper, The Liberator, which supported the cause ideologically and likely financially. He was hired in June by the Society's Agency Committee. By December, though, that committee was reporting it could not pay another agent, so it is likely he was not getting paid either. Personal tragedy, tragedy struck in 1841. His wife, Mary Meriwether Rankin, died, triggering a lot of activity, including her mother coming to join the family to care for the household and surviving children. Two of their children also died in Fort Wayne. Apparently, the property at Hannah and Lewis wouldn't work anymore as a home, so two days after his wife's death, Rankin sold that property to a John Du Bois for $1,000 and bought a downtown lot on the north side of Berry Street. Six days after that, he bought the lot south of his church, stretching from the alley to Wayne Street along Lafayette from Samuel Hanna, including a mortgage. We calculate that he had $430 left to build a house. In 1842, he sold the Lafayette Street lot to a young Presbyterian cabinet maker named Benjamin Tower, who then sold the north part of it to another young Presbyterian, this time a man who had attended medical school named Henry P. Ayers, for a price that confirms a structure exists there. And the Rankins continued to live here. The Reverend continued his work as pastor of the Presbyterian Church and as agent for the Anti-Slavery Society, whether he was getting paid or not. Most likely not, or spottily. The congregation struggled to pay him too after the Panic of 1837, which set off a depression lasting into the 1840s. The space between the parsonage and the church was used as a community commons. A number of public gatherings took place there, including the town's 1842 July 4th celebration. The Presbyterians must have been proud. But more trouble was brewing. In the heated congressional campaign of 1843, Rankin was apparently known to favor the Whig candidate, Louis G. Thompson, who was an abolitionist. That knowledge drew the attention of enemies, who published an open letter to him in the Marion newspaper that was reprinted in Fort Wayne's Sentinel on August 19, 1843. He was said to have sent a letter hoping to influence the election. The anonymous letter writer was against, quote, clerical interference. Here's the letter addressed to clerical politicians. We would be pleased if some friend of the Reverend Mr. Rankin of Fort Wayne, the Presbyterian clergyman of that place, would favor us with a copy of the letter sent to that gentle, by that gentleman to the abolitionists of this county. We have no wish to do injustice to the Reverend gentleman and regret that we are compelled to notice his interference, but if the letter purports to contain the matter we are advised it does, his clerical robes shall not screen him from the lash. Should we not be allowed to see it, we shall take it for granted that our information is correct and that it was only designed to aid Mr. Thompson by secret circulation among the abolitionists and nowhere else. Five days later, he resigned his position at the church, citing household and pecuniary concerns and opportunities elsewhere, because the church still had not found a way to catch up to the salary payments it owed him, even though it was trying. He stayed in the area for a few more months, working for the American Home Missionary Society. By October 2nd, 1843, a Miss Matilda Wallace was advertising that she was beginning the female seminary in the house, quote, lately occupied by A.T. Rankin. He moved to Western New York State with his family in early 1844 and continued his pastoral work. Despite his personal tragedy and the enemies he attracted in the Fort Wayne area, where there were abolitionists, but they were not in the majority, Rankin had been professionally busy. 
Historian George Mather, in his History of Fort Wayne's Early Congregations, praises Alexander T. Rankin. I quote, if there was a white leader of Fort Wayne's Underground Railroad operatives during the late 1830s and early 1840s, it was most likely the Reverend Alexander T. Rankin, pastor of the First Presbyterian Church, a founder of the Indiana Anti-Slavery Society and brother of the Reverend John Rankin, who assisted escaping slaves at Ripley, Ohio, Mather wrote. Former Arch Executive Director Angie Quinn counts Rankin and this house among the documented sites of Underground Railroad activity in Allen County in her essay, History of African Americans in Fort Wayne to 1870, in the book, History of Fort Wayne and Allen County, 1700 to 2005. And we have these three other factors to consider. Levi Coffin of what is now Fountain City, Indiana's most famous and best documented underground railroad leader, is documented as noting the successful activities of the network here during Rankin's time, when he sent two freedom seekers through Fort Wayne bearing this note. Please receive and forward the same to George D. Baptist, Detroit, Michigan, by way of Camden and Fort Wayne. I consider this to be the safest route. Quinn's essay notes 13 documented sites of Underground Railroad in Allen County and five other possible sites, so he could have intended the travelers to seek help at any of those sites. Support here for the Underground Railroad would continue through the 1840s and into the 1860s. Second point, the Rankin family were known Underground Railroad conductors, as was the family of Rankin's first wife, Mary, in Ripley, Ohio. Descendants of John Rankin told Arts that John's brother, Alexander, was an Underground Railroad operator, too, which supports the likelihood that he would have continued that activity while he was in Fort Wayne. Finally, the Rankin house has a half wall in the basement that invites speculation about hiding fugitive slaves behind it once they were in the basement, whose trapdoor entry would have been easily hidden under a rug in the room above. However, architects who have studied the house disagree about that wall. One study argues that it was built after Rankin's time in the house, making using it to hide people fleeing slavery impossible. So we have no conclusive evidence either way, just the possibility. So that's one inconclusive thing about the Rankin house. But the house also has a genuine mystery. The mystery about this house is, why is it two houses stuck together? When was that done? And why? It's easy to be distracted by wondering how people in the mid-1800s moved a frame house that had been built elsewhere to this lot and connected it to a brick house. They did not have diesel-powered caterpillar-treaded crawlers to load it on or cranes to lift it or hydraulic jacks or any of the things we use to move buildings today. But that's just technology, and the smart people of the time obviously had technology that worked because they did it. So the question really is, why and when? So once again, we turn to property sales records looking for confirming details. In 1847, Henry P. Ayers sold this property to Asa Naylor. In 1849, Naylor sold it to John G. Mayer, who had moved to Fort Wayne from Ohio in 1845 and ran a grocery store on Columbia Street. Finally, with an 1855 tax map, we have a drawing of the outline of the building on this lot that confirms the frame building is attached to the masonry building at that time and Mayer owns it. We don't know how long the frame structure has been there though. Here are two views of the dual structure from the two architectural studies Arches commissioned during its restoration work on Rankin House. First, the more romantic view. Just as the west masonry wall, now the back wall, was bowing out and in danger of collapsing in 2003 when the study was done, this report argues that an original masonry wall on the building's east could have collapsed at some time before 1855, and the wood structure was added hurriedly, proven by the poorness of the fit and the badly draining roof angle it creates, on the shallow foundation of the old wall's bricks, because the wooden structure's foundation is on bricks that match the masonry structure. The masonry structure has tension rods running north and south through it for stabilization and such rods were already in use by the 1830s, so they could have been used. Also, for some reason, an interior masonry wall that could be load-bearing is not used to bear any load, which has no explanation. There's also a more utilitarian view. The second, later report argues that the north and south masonry walls were built not to tie into other masonry, though it cannot explain why. The ends that would have fit into an east masonry wall are instead smoothly finished without the brick pattern that would have joined them to another wall at right angles. 
This report continues to describe how the wood structure was nevertheless hurriedly attached and not well fit to the masonry structure. For example, the wood structure is two inches wider than the masonry structure and the crew that attached it just found a way to make that work. Also, the, the connection between the two roofs is one that had more time been taken could have been corrected to eliminate the drainage problems caused by it. We have not been able to document where the wooden structure came from, why it was chosen and attached the way it was, and why the masonry structure only has three sides. It is easy to believe that Rankin might have wanted more room for his family or a more modern place for his mother-in-law than the original hall and parlor home, even though it was a very nice home for the time, which is the germ of a story about how he could have been the cause of the two buildings being joined if he decided to do it in a hurry. The joining of the two buildings changed a lot about the house. Its original front door may well have been the west entrance, now the back door, the door facing the church and all the activities of town. It's the nicest facade of the masonry building, and it would lead visitors into what could have been the parlor. A side door is available on the south side for the family to come and go from what would have been the hall, which is where all the cooking and work of the house would have been happening. After the wooden house was added, the front door became the Lafayette Street door, and the front room was no longer the old parlor. It was the room with the slate fireplace. The city was growing, and Lafayette Street now had addresses. John G. and Elizabeth Mayer probably didn't care about any of this, unless they were the people who added the wooden structure to the masonry one, which we will never know. They had a stylish home and a good location that presented them well as movers and shakers in a growing town becoming a city. The Meyers must have been interesting people. They got things done. John G. Meyer came from Ohio after emigrating there from Germany to open his store, which was more than a simple grocery store. He made and sold the city's first ice cream. He grew and sold the city's first strawberries. He sold the first toys. He sold musical instruments and was a musician himself. Being a member of the Kikiangas band that was invited to play for Governor Whitcomb's inauguration in Indianapolis, because they were believed to be the best band in the state. He made and sold the city's first grape wine, which was also used at his church. He was elected township trustee and then appointed postmaster, gaining some fame as the first postmaster to receive mail from the railroad, going down to the trains to pick up the letters and carrying them back to the post office, which was in his store, in his jacket pocket. He was elected assessor in 1877 and died in 1880. His wife Elizabeth also left her mark on the city. Both of them had signed the papers in 1846 as charter members of their church, Trinity English Evangelical Lutheran Church, along with other community leaders. And she hosted that important meeting at this house in 1859 that marked the beginning of the church's women's societies after months and months of work on teas and church dinners and sales. She died in 1883, and they both are buried in Lindenwood Cemetery. We can't make a direct connection from John and Elizabeth to the next important family that owned and lived in this house, the DeWoods. We have to infer from context, and there's a lot of context. When the Myers bought this house, Fort Wayne had not yet seen its first locomotive or laid its first railway tracks. By the time of their deaths, the city had changed from a river and canal facing commercial center to a railroad based manufacturing powerhouse. A lot of the manufacturing was on this side of town, and something called suburbanization had already begun. Manufacturing is dirty and loud, and it brings crowds of workers together in the factories. People who could get, who could get away from the noise and the crowds and the smells and the dirt did so by moving to newer neighborhoods often made attractive by nearby streetcar lines. The old Meyer house was no longer such a prime address. That may be why Joseph DeWood, listed as a laborer in the 1917 city directory, was able to own it. In an early directory, before he lived here, he was listed as an engineer. Maybe he was very financially smart and saved. Maybe he had an inheritance he used, or maybe somehow he was related to the Myers. But at any rate, he came to own the house and his family became one of the home's most important protectors. In that 1917 city directory, Joseph is in this home with his wife Mary and three boarders, all named DeWood. They are probably two brothers, listed as the manager and the proprietor of a restaurant, and a sister who is a waitress at a lunch counter. Sounds like either they're all working together to afford the house, or Joseph and Mary are helping the siblings get on their feet. By 1929, Mary has died, Joseph has remarried, and a son James is in the family home. 
By 1937, the brothers are both in the city directory with wives and other address, and Sister Rose is a cook and living on Clay Street. Joseph died in 1941 and was buried in Catholic Cemetery, where Mary is buried too. Second wife Lucille lived alone on Lafayette Street through 1960, but in the 1961 directory, son James has joined her here. At that time, he is listed as a bottler at the Falstaff Brewery. Lucille died in 1980 and is also buried in Catholic Cemetery. James continued to live in the house and he is the one who gets the home, which he calls the Meyer DeWood House, protected as a local historic district in 1984. James died in 2001 and is also buried in Catholic Cemetery. Interestingly, his local historic district nomination makes no mention of Alexander Rankin or the house's earliest history. It didn't need to to qualify for the protection because what he did present was deemed architecturally and historically significant enough. The story goes on though, which is important because otherwise the Reverend Rankin's role might have been forgotten. Fort Wayne real estate developer Cook Lockheed, also an Allen County Council member, civic leader, and philanthropist, became owner of the house by the time it was listed in the 1994 city directory as Lockheed Enterprises, Inc. It was his office, no longer a home, until he donated it to Arch in 2004. At that point, work to, restore the, to rescue the building, restore it, and turn it into Arch's office began, and it had attracted the attention of Indiana Freedom Trails, the State of Indiana Underground Railroad program, which drew additional attention to Rankin's contribution and presence in the state. It is Arch's home today, after hundreds of thousands of dollars of research and investment from grants, donations, Arch memberships, and staff and volunteer hours of work. The restoration is not complete, and Arch's leaders are planning when we can take the next necessary and desirable steps in this building's preservation history. Great care was taken to let us connect with this house's history when the restoration of the first floor was done. In this room, we see the slate fireplace and surround Elizabeth Meyer undoubtedly was proud of, and the cupboards that were found during the restoration after someone had covered them over sometime during the 1800s. Generous donors gave Arch period furniture, this lovely bench and piano, to properly furnish this room. I think the late Mrs. Rankin's mother, if she lived in this part of the house after she came to help Alexander, and Elizabeth Meyer would have been pleased. I also think it's important to remember that 30,000 cars have not always rushed past this house every day. When the house was built, it faced either south or west, and the roads, such as they were, were dirt. By the Myers heyday, the roads may or may not have been paved, but the sounds would have been hooves and train and factory whistles. Plus the bells of their church next door, which was, which was originally hung in 1837 during the Reverend Rankin's tenure. The DeWoods bought the house in the aftermath of World War I and owned it through the Roaring Twenties, the Depression, World War II, and all the changes in turmoil and growth of the post-war period. What a ride. I am so grateful to James DeWood for protecting his family home and making the effort to learn its history. That's the heritage James DeWood helped save for us in 1984 when he had his family home protected as a local historic district. And that's the heritage Cook Lockheed enabled Arch to preserve and restore for the community to connect with when he donated the house to us in 2004. And that's the heritage I get to work in every day. It's a heritage that is part of your city and your home too. And Arch exists to welcome you to connect with your heritage. The Alexander T. Rankin House is our little house with a big history. Thank you for exploring it with me.